let's go ahead and start this meeting on uh, December 8th for 703. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation. Thank you, Dr. Willick, for changing the agenda before we got here with the uh, executive session. So thank you very much. There are some changes on the agenda. Approval of minutes. I'll entertain a motion to approve the November 17th minutes. Uh, Jacob Mario moved to approve the November 17th minutes. Tony Holt, second. Any discussion? I guess that my name is spelled incorrectly in the minutes. Okay. And it got to just correct it. Oh, have, um, has it been misspelled in other minutes as well? I don't know. I can't say that I've been observant of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, this is, we'll just, um, we'll make sure we contact Shanisa and just make sure that the name spelling is correct. So, any other items on there? Okay. Um, we can do a roll call vote so that, I'm sorry, Anne, right? Yeah, Annie. <laughs> Annie, Annie will have everyone's name down so that she can get used to it. So I'll go through. Uh, Gina? Aye. Aye. Jacob? Aye. Sophia? Aye. Dina? Aye. Tony? Aye. Christina? Aye. I'm an aye as well. Therefore, they unanimously pass. As long as we make sure that we change Sophia's spelling. <laughs> Thank you. To public participation, where we will allow two minutes, and there's no one here in public, but perhaps on the internet, if you could please raise your hand. Dr. Willett will put the timer up for two minutes, and then we will go from there. So we have uh, Rebecca. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, earlier today, Rebecca Risley, 103 Mountain Spring Road. Earlier today, I attended the policy committee meeting, and the chair, Mr. Holt, shared information about CABE's. I'd like to know if the board has a social media policy for board members or if Shipman, as the board lawyer, has recommended that they do so. Several weeks ago, a member of the board, Ms. Plord, shared a political cartoon to a private Facebook group on Mask Our Kids in Holland and asked that the group asked of the group whether they thought it was appropriate. It's important to make the distinction that whether she was posting it as a private resident as opposed to as a board member is irrelevant because the responses from the others involved as a board member, and that's how she was viewed in making those comments. So in this instance, there was no delineation between the two. Several days later, a citizen shared that same political cartoon to two additional Facebook call -in groups and created quite a firestorm. This was handled poorly and incorrectly every step of the way. The town council then reached out to the board with an email authored by Councilman Luba with very little information and incorrect assumptions were made about the teacher, the intent, General. A damaging article was then published in the Journal Inquirer. This reinforces the need for our board to have a social media policy, as well as the board educating the, pu the public that they are not the first stop on the journey for this type of issue. This should have been addressed privately first with the teacher, and if there wasn't a comfort level for that, then with the principal and from there the superintendent if necessary. This continued miscommunication to the public that they should immediately contact the board for all circumstances administrative issues should be rectified. It's not their wheelhouse or their responsibility. Also, telling people on social media to reach out to board members by phone or text as a means to circumvent or avoid having their messages subject to FOIA guidelines is ethically wrong and counter to the board's claims of being transparent in their communications. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there anyone else at this time that would like to raise their hand? Start the timer. Hearing none, we will adjourn the correspondence. Yes. Oh, go ahead. I did not see that. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, James. <laughs> I did not have seen that. <laughs> All right. So, but.
last board meeting and now the board received six emails. We received an email asking why the Tallinn Board of Education did not get a chance to vote on the COVID vaccine clinics. An email requesting information regarding Birch Grove's crumbling foundation for a research project. An email requesting that the town prepare a long-term maintenance plan for the turf field paired with a short-term bonding request. The author stressed that the board should not need to pay for the field. An email asking to pay for the turf field via short-term bonds rather than grants. Stating that bonding for the turf field would be irresponsible given the short lifespan of the field. The author urges the town and the board to set aside money each year to pay for the field in full when replacement time comes. And an email advocating for the use of political cartoons and urging the curriculum committee to take the side of teachers when reviewing associated controversies. The author argues that it is not the role of board members to have a say, an active say in the curriculum. Okay, thank you, Jacob. So at this time, I will open up information for board members, and then I'm sure that will you'll have a few things to add in. Go ahead, um, I had two things. Uh, one was just a question for Dr. Willett. Um, I was wondering if we were doing any more COVID clinics for the five to 11 age group on school grounds during school hours. And um, my second thing is more was just a statement. I just kind of wanted to talk to the board as a whole. Personally, was very disappointed at the way the joint meeting went with the council. I, that was the first I had heard that the council had put into their capital budget that they bonded for the upcoming turf field, the one that comes up in 2023. I think we probably could have basically avoided this meeting at this time had we known that the council had done that. That was unknown to me as finance and facilities chairperson. So I was disappointed with that. And then again, I was disappointed that we didn't even talk about the whole plan going forward. I thought that was kind of the whole point to the joint meeting and I don't know if the council um, thought differently. I did send an email basically stating this to the council and I did receive a reply from Mr. Jones as chair of the council he had a completely different expectation of what that meeting was supposed to be about. So I'm just kind of saying it to our board here that I hope that we will continue to reach out to the council and have that discussion because I really just don't think we really got very far <laughs> with it at the meeting last week. So I just wanted to kind of, again, let you guys know that that's kind of my feelings on it as chair of FFC. Yeah. Yeah, just in response to Ms. Uh, Risley's uh, comments during public participation that no, uh, as of now, the board does not have a social media policy. Uh, there are a series of policies that, that discuss communication and that talk about, you know, the appropriate place to take uh, various concerns. Uh, looking at the CABE library, CABE does have a couple of examples as far as social media uh, I don't recall if Shipman has one in theirs, uh, but looking across at various boards, it, it's kind of a mixed bag as to which ones do and which ones don't. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, let's go to Clark. Thank you, Ashley. Um, I just wanted to mention um, thank you to uh, Ashley and Walt for giving me the opportunity to speak with our lawyer. Uh, and she told me I nothing wrong. Um, having freedom of speech is part of being an elected official. Uh, I'm absolutely allowed to talk or text with any constituents. Uh, lesson learned, though, I will not text anymore, uh, as someone did try to get my personal phone. Um, as far as the social media policy goes, I'm on the policy committee. Uh, we can talk about it, but I doubt I will would, would vote to have a social media policy, because really, the only way to remove a board member is be voted off the island. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, in terms of the turf field, uh, I was too a little disappointed with the outcome of that meeting. I just want the board to recognize that the responsible way to keep this turf field for our students uh, is to pay for it with cash up front 
and then use the revenues to create a sinking fund so that in 10 years, uh, the next board, whoever's sitting at this table, um, won't be in the same situation. So thank you. Thank you, Clark. Anyone else? Oh, go ahead. Just really quickly, um, I agree with what everyone said about the joint meeting. I, I left not even knowing what our where now is, uh, where do we go from here, um, which typically when you leave a meeting of any kind, you want to know what's the next step. So um, I agree with everybody, with, with what everybody needed. I think a lot of people, have, this is two, a, lo a lot of people have spoken to me personally about the, the social media um, uh, policies, and I think it's worth investigating, at least looking into um, it doesn't have to be a, 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 there doesn't have to be a set conclusion right now, but I think it, when people keep bringing it up, I think it deserves at least the attention. Um, so we, you know, nothing has to be done immediately, but I think some, some thought should go into it. So that, but that's it. Um, so I just wanted to throw a couple things out. Um, the capital binding that was definitely new. Um, I do think that this joint conversation for the turf field would have been different had we had it back in May with the full board that we didn't have another two members that didn't getting caught up and about two council members being caught up. So I think that that kind of, we need to start a little bit back versus like just going forward. So I do understand that that, you know, the capital bonding was definitely new. And at this point, I think that having the experts at this meeting to talk about whether we well, not we decide, but I guess the town council decides whether we do grass or turf, we don't even know which direction they're going to go into. So we can't say exactly what they're going to pay or bond when we don't even know, are they going to allow us to keep the turf? Are they going to have the field? Like, I mean, I think that that was conversation and getting people up to speed because like I said, it wasn't the same people. I mean, I know it seems like we keep on talking about it and talking about it and getting nowhere because Essentially, that's what it seems like because we've been talking about it since May <laughs> with the field and grounds. So I definitely think we need to keep the door open to have those conversations about the bonding and, and how we're we paying for this. Like Ford was saying, if there's money we can put aside for sync. But as of right now, that conversation, I think, had to take place first. Okay, what are we looking at? What are we going to do? And they still have to have that discussion as to what they want to put in. I mean... Sadly, we don't have the final side if it goes grass or if it goes turf. So I think it was more about voicing our opinion on that. And we did have a lot of questions along with the CRF. So it, it yes, <laughs> there's just a lot of factors I think that go into it. And it would have been different had we had this conversation back in May. But now that we have getting everybody up to speed, you kind of have to <laughs> take a step back and then move forward. Um, I don't know, Dr. Willick, you wanted to talk about the COVID? Um, yes, you have a couple of things to answer. I'm just quickly to talk about COVID. And just briefly on the meeting, just, just to just throw it out there. Um, you know, I know that the uh, chairperson uh, Mungren had tried to, to set up a meeting prior to that. So to your credit, you were trying. You know, and I think that um, I do want to say um, the town uh, staff and uh, the staff that was there, I think, was working really hard to answer all the questions that people were coming up with. So I want to compliment the, the staff that was there for doing their best to answer all the questions and provide all the information. I think that was uh, their, their role was to, to try to make sure you as two elected bodies were as informed as you could possibly be. And that's why there were a lot of questions coming at them. And I think they tried to answer them. So I just want to give kudos to the staff for doing that. So. Thank all the staff for their involvement, for coming that night, you know, Peter for coming that night kind of thing, um, and then all the town staff. Um, uh, vaccine clinics, no. Uh, there's two, to, there's two, you always have to have two, but no, that it has happened in the past, uh, last year, this year, but I don't anticipate actually having any more vaccine clinics unless they're boosters for staff. Um, beyond that, I don't anticipate it at this time doing anything more like that. Um, uh, and uh, screen to stay, just update quickly on that. Um, very effective, we're keeping kids in the classroom, uh, extremely time intensive. Um, last night we had four, yesterday we had four, tonight we have three, it takes about 2.5 hours to process each, each case. Um, so 
Uh, screen to stay has been extremely effective in keeping kids in classroom. And I think that is extremely important. I would not want to see that go away. Um, distinction that is hard still for, uh, understandably difficult for people to process because there's so many, you know, there's a lot of information. It only covers uh, children that are in the classroom or in uh, transportation that is school. So what happens is if it's youth sports or if it's a birthday party or it's run a roll or whatever it is, and I'm no, no comment on a particular business, or <laughs> a, a, a ambiguous roller skating place somewhere in you know, New Jersey <laughs> is, and I'm not, and not and it, it, all these places are working really hard to make sure everybody's safe. Um, but basically just saying if it's outside of school, then we have to apply quarantine. And quarantine is the eight, you know, you can test on the fifth, sixth, seventh day, return on the eighth, 10 days out, that stays the same. So the complexity of this has actually increased greatly, but the benefit is there for kids to, to be in school. So though we had 42 children um, identified, uh, I think it was yesterday, those 42 kids, um, you know, we assume the parents want screen to stay. And if they want to have the child quarantined out of school, that's their right. Um, but those 42 kids, most of them are able to stay in school. So um, I do suspect we're going to see more and more of these increasing numbers of actual positives. The difference between um, you know, March of 2020 and now, and that's why you see very different policy coming out from the state, from the DPH, the vaccines make the uh, impact of the virus more like uh, a cold than, than some of the worst impacts otherwise. So it's, it's why you'll see, I mentioned that because that's why you'll see the policy shift. I think you're going to see that even though you have highly contagious versions, Delta, AKA Omicron looking like it might be more even, it's not got the, it's not putting people in the hospital and it's not, it's not got the other negative effects and so on. So because of that, this will continue to move in my opinion in the direction of um, being treated like a flu or a cold eventually versus being treated as something that requires out of school quarantines. That is the trend, even I think with Omicron, but the reason they're pushing the vaxes and the boosters is because those make, you know, it's far, you're far less likely to then pick up COVID if you have that. And you're far less severe impacts if you have the, if you have the vaccine. So screen to stay has been keeping kids in school. I anticipate that things will be moving more in the direction of um, you know, how we handle viruses like the flu. And I think you'll see those policy shifts occurring in the next two to three months. Thank you, Dr. Wolf. Out of the time, any other last comments? Go ahead. Um, as far as the, the turf field situation, the they had on the Capitol right across. I definitely think that that was an interesting comment when they said I had made mention of that. I think that might have changed the tone of the conversation or changed kind of how we came prepared for the conversation. Uh, some of the things that I was trying to kind of ask Lisa was the original grant that we had received also has, um, you can use that same grant or apply for that grant for, uh, I can't remember what it is, like remodeling or refurnishing or whatever the word is to redo. So I definitely to look at that again that same grant that we had for the original field i definitely think that um you know that they have it on the capital request we need to keep that that conversation open um so that's super important i get concerned though when we're talking about this now where a lot of stakeholders didn't kind of hold up their end of the bargain and my concern by paying things up front the cash at hand um is we could be utilizing those funds for other educational specific versus like the turf field, do it, whether it be SPED, whether it be curriculum, whether it be other programs or tools for those programs or resources for those programs. Um, and again, I get concerned with the fact that different stakeholders did not hold their end of the bargain. I'm afraid that that was kind of the elephant in the room that nobody really talked about at that meeting. Um, so I get concerned that people aren't gonna do that. We're gonna be back in the same place. 10 years from now. I mean, there were people that were supposed to be putting money towards in, a, in an account into the, the slusher fund or whatever they called it, right? And into this different fund and UConn's no longer here yielding revenue. So that's another situation that we're not going to be 
earning that revenue kind of coming in. So I don't really think it's a further conversation. Um, I do too wish it was more of a fluid conversation. There was a little bit more information that we had given to us coming in. Uh, anyways, neither here nor there. I just think we need to have that conversation. And uh, please, when she said it was on the capital budget, uh, capital request for the 2022-2023 year. Um, as far as um, Ms. Risley and the social media and the different thing, um, I too understand there's freedom of speech. I too understand that, you know, we're volunteers sitting at this table, right? They're elected volunteers doing this and this is something, but I definitely think we can look at something with a, an ethics policy or a I know like our ethics is monetarily focused on versus behaviorally uh, or inappropriateness or any of those kind of things. I don't know if that's something that we can talk about. Um, I definitely think that, um, you know, freedom of speech is important, right? But I also think that a, a, a board, whether it be the board of the, the town council or any, any committee um, representing the town, there needs to be some sort of structure of what's appropriate or what's not appropriate. Because even when I'm, Dana, the parent anymore. I'm Dana, the, the representative of my company. So I'm now I'm Dana, the representative of the Town Board of Education. So I have to be, I have to be aware of that. So I definitely think there needs to be some sort of structure. So I think that conversation can continue to happen as well. If, and those are my thoughts around it. Yeah, it we, the, the Ethics Commission uh, Committee, it isn't just monetary. Okay. It is for everything. Is that because I remember this coming up yeah. two years ago, a year and a half ago, and I remember having to. And it is not only just monetary. So, can we look further into that? Maybe through policy or what I mean, that looks like? Be something for the tracker. Have a bit deeper conversation on it. We'll, we'll add that to the tracker. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> because we current, I mean, we have a civility policy. We do have a policy that talks about general responsibility right. and those kind of things. So, where a specific uh, social media policy may or may not be appropriate, there may be opportunities in the existing. To guide, yeah. So we, we can certainly look at it. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah, I think they're, yeah, again, I think the stronger guidelines should be because I think it is a little bit good. All right, um, let's go to floor. I just want to say a couple of years ago when that ethics commission came up, I, and I don't even remember what that was for, um, you can file a complaint. <laughs> Like, you can file a complaint, and if I did something wrong, you know, you can find me. But like Dana said, I'm, a, I'm an elected volunteer, and I'm here to a wide array of constituents. And, you know, if I talk to people that don't necessarily agree with one another, um, you know, that's part of hearing all voices. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Jacob? Yeah, I'll keep it quick. Um, now, just in regards to the turf field, I know several emails talked about uh, grants um, and some of them kind of criticized the idea. I don't know if those comments are directed specifically to so I've asked about looking into that further. I just wanted to clarify that when I talked about that, I meant we should definitely look into it as an option. You know, if there's money available, we should look into it, but we definitely need to have a plan in place that does not rely on crossing our fingers hoping to get money from the state. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So as far as where that conversation goes from for now, um, I know it's not going to be the last time the council speaks to it. I know as we as individuals can keep an eye on it, advocate in our ways. Um, and that's kind of where it stands right now. But I wanted to clear that. Uh -huh. Oh, let's go to Jim. Actually, I had an easy question on another topic. I um, I don't know what so there's been a lot of talk over the last week about school safety and it's been all over the news and board of eds has gone into special sessions and I know there's been a lot of superintendent meetings and so I was just curious about what is public information I'm not sure what's under the board's purview um, I didn't know if we were going to have any conversations um, about that coming up at all or about if our safety plans have been updated with the state things like that. Um, so we're in the process of updating the plan of the state. Uh, Birch Grove being new with uh, some of its new schematics and pictures. These are things we're trying to get the new stuff from so we can include it in the plan. Um, uh, there is for every school district a plan, um, generally termed the all hazard plan. We don't publish that plan um, because that plan has everything in it. It has all of the 
protocols and everything, and that would not be something that we would typically want to put out there to the world. However, I could present to the board of bed on that and any individual board member, you know, like I could present an executive session or something. We'd have to check to see if that fits as an executive session with you know, Jessica. But each individual, absolutely, I could sit down with and talk about it. Um, but I would not uh, recommend, or would I actually ever present this plan in a public session for it's 250 pages and it covers literally everything. So um, there are many, many protocols that we use. Um, there's ton, a lot of technology. This district is a lot safer than it was. Um, you know, when I first started here a long, long time ago as a, as a principal, you didn't have um, all the uh, technology, you know, thanks to many people, you know, Pierce Daba and the others, you know, there's, there's grants, we move much forward, much, much faster technology. We have radio systems and alert systems, and notification systems and monitoring systems. Um, your, your schools are safer than most places on the planet right now. You know, however, um, you know, the world is a ugly place sometimes. Um, so if there's, uh, you know, if any individual wants to know more about this, I can talk to them about it. That would be a, you know, that would be about as far as I could go in terms of the, that plan, and, and I'm happy to discuss it at any time and go through protocols, things like that. But we do have a lot, and I could do a general presentation on the security. And and <laughs> and along with that as well, like um, I've seen a lot of discussions again on the news and whatnot about mental health and the resources needed, especially during situations like we just had. Is that? So discuss at that time as part of oh absolutely yeah yeah and anything that you wanted to know we could do a whole presentation on mental health and the services the district's uh, district provides um one of the obstacles for us today in mental health is is not so much what happens at the school but how hard it is for families to access it beyond so we we can deal with their like ground you know ground we can deal with um uh, and we have many resources social workers school counselors and everything to help kids in the their struggle. But for instance, if a child is struggling with OCD, that's something you have to go get a specialist to help with to help most optimally. And that's where things break down for families. Trying to find someone, find someone who has seats or has, you know, has available, uh, can take available cases, their insurance, how much it will pay. Sometimes it's pro-pay, sometimes it doesn't pay. Sometimes there's a high deductible. So families have many obstacles to mental health care that um, the schools help at and help with the families at an immediate level, work with the town and that type of thing, and have mechanisms to help kids who are struggling. But um, when they go for specialized services, you know, which is what happens, you know, severe anxiety, that type of thing, they have a hard time finding it. And that's, I think, one of our bigger challenges as a culture. Thank you. Uh, Griffin? I was just wondering, this type of question for you or for Dr. Willett. Um, has the been closed or done with the FOIA request? We have many pending FOIA requests okay. and none of them, well, none of the current uh, FOIA requests are done. Okay. Uh, they are pretty large and they're all pending. Okay, thank you. And we have to triage, you know, like go from one and then spend time on this one and then spend time on this one to try to get each of these getting something in some regular form. So why do you bring that up? Um, board members, please put down January the TH, T, Town High School at seven o'clock with Jessica. She'll do the roles, responsibilities, and the FOIA. So that is the newest and well, confirmed date, uh, January 5th. We had to move it due to some issues. Oh, so um, that is the confirmed date. Okay, so at this time, um, I will go ahead and move on to our student representative reports. So we have Emily and Natalie. Hi, ladies. So our food drive ended the week of Thanksgiving break and we were able to raise about $200 to put towards um, grocery store gift cards sent to the food drive. And um, in, uh, during COVID, we did online volunteering and we're continuing, we have continued doing that in student council. We're just making letters and to a website and the website sends it to people. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> and there is coffee house tomorrow night. 
tomorrow. It's so it's not really coffee house. Oh no, not coffee house. So winter pop. Yeah. Concert. Yes. Yeah. So like chamber choir and our women's chorus and jazz band are putting on like a holiday concert. Yes, I just saw, yeah. <laughs> my niece was in coffee house so long. And I just that's one of the first things I saw. Yeah. Um, and also Friday. Uh, PJs for the children. Yes. Yeah, bring a dollar, I think. Yep, bring a dollar and get to wear PJs. You yeah. see how much that raised? That's amazing. It's raised almost $86,000. Wow. Say that again. Uh, it's raised almost eighty, eighty-six to 88000 towards its 500000 which is credit to these young adults who are helping make that happen. And um, we're at more than uh, more than 1000 district-wide ourselves, so it's great. That's awesome. Wow. Yeah, the daycare that I doing that as well using get you the kids get to wear pajamas this year for your doll that's awesome guys yeah we would need a lot of uh, social emotional support if I were to dress in my pajamas, which is why I won't be doing that. But my heart is with this project. I just know that. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Okay, um, let's move to the superintendent's report. So we have the monthly financials. So as you know. Uh, that at the beginning or the first meeting of the month, typically we have the monthly financial report. Um, Mr. McLaughlin uh, provides a general letter, which is an overview of the budget as it stands at this moment in time. Uh, basically, we have an available balance at the end of uh, the last, uh, last month of $753,633, or 1.85% of the board's current budget. Um, the expenditure one pager there is, uh, or rather the budget, Page there is included um, in the packet. Um, people online can see it on the packet as well. Um, you may have to blow it up a bit, but it's there. Um, and so I'll just go over some of the highlights of it. And then um, through finance and facilities, uh, we, you know, we'll go into more detail, I'll try to answer anything you throw at me right now, but um, you can also extrapolate further at that time. So here are some um, items, salaries, which is basically, which is line 110 typically on there. And I'll try to uh, identify the lines and talk through it. Um, currently over by 424 because uh, same thing as last month. You know, we have the associate educators and the teachers and uh, ESY in there. We still need to get the grants backfilling that once the grants as are two and three um, are, are credited into the system, those will come back into balance. Uh, substitute line um, available balance is, um, is you know, healthy at this time of year, which is good. Um, still the beginning of the year, of course, we use. Uh, PD push-ins um, and uh, you know and coverage. We are starting to see um, the effects of the more contagious sort of flow of uh, of COVID. And where it's really hitting us now is the staff are getting hit again, but they're getting hit where their kids are are, are impacted and they uh, have to stay home. So we are going to see that subline hit pretty hard in the next few months as we get through the winter months. Um, there's more um, more kids that are forced into parents have to stay home with them, then we will have to get subs to cover. Um, and that's that's how that goes. Uh, overtime, uh, one that so subs is uh, 120 overtime and struck 130 cannot be encumbered. So um, currently under budget, but you know as overtime is incurred, we still have many months of the year to go. Stipends is code 150. Um, they're currently over by 45, similar to prior years. Um, the stipends are encumbered for the entire year. Paid fully collected, as you know, um, pay to play is the 200 plus for players. Um, so this these funds will come back in as those are collected and you'll notice that eventually that will balance out. But it is encumbered um, at the beginning. Health insurance, severance, and employee benefits, you're looking at codes 210, you know, uh, well 200, I'm sorry, 190, 200, 210, um, roughly, and they collect, they're collectively under budget right now, but that makes sense because we haven't incurred all the employee benefits Insurance costs, so that that's why that line would be, you know, um, where it is right now. Any newly hired or retired or FICO or Social Securities is uh, 220. Um, you know, those who retire, we don't have too many of those right now, but um, we may see quite a few of those in the next couple of months. So the available balance is 86 under. Um, we'll probably stay about the same, but um, you know, we do typically start to see people put in their retirements, things like that. We actually do actively encourage that because if we know who is retiring, it can help us plan for budget. So we do encourage them to do that. 
And we do have a little program where if you tell us early enough, then you know, there's a thousand dollars that can go in your way if you tell us soon enough to be able to save us the money. So, um, so we may see some people coming in and doing some uh, putting in of their retirements in the next month or so. Um, that'll kind of start to affect um, benefits consultants and workers. Uh, 270, 310, they're under as of November. Legal audit tech. 340, 350. Um, they're under, but don't expect that to stay that way. I don't at all expect legal to stay that way. Um, it's just a way it still it goes sometimes. Um, all repair and maintenance, custodial cleaning, uh, those technical kinds of expense, 420, 430. They continue to expend as the year goes on. They're usually cyclical costs. So some expenses, um, you'll see them occur as the year goes on, but BGP, that's probably going to increase some of those. So BGP wasn't, you know, it was modulars last year. It's not modulars anymore. So you can expect full building costs for certain things. Um, and you'll see some of those things go up. Um, the electricity and other things. Um, oil, I think they're heated by oil. Um, transportation, 510 over budget for um, November. Um, this is mostly due to routes and access to uh, Haven Transportation, uh, which is a company that services our students of special education. Um, so the overage is, is mostly for that. That can fluctuate if things change over the year, but that's where that is right now. Tuitions, uh, over again, 454. Um, this is due to a change in the programming and that is somewhat impacted by COVID. And that may not be a forever thing, but it's definitely um, and that's not just uh, us. We saw some, as we noticed last year, uh, unexpected, you know, um, unexpended tuition funds because the programs were not offered. Now these programs are back and they're back the way that we're back, offering things to help remediate, uh, to help ameliorate some of the impacts of the pandemic, um, things like that. So those program expenses have gone up um, and that hits the district whenever that happens. And so, uh, you know, that, that does, number of people either. That can be um, quite a small number of people. Um, energy 620 expenses of 1.4 million were transferred to the town to the Universal Internal Service Fund. Um, that that Those letters move around all the time. It's, it's UISF, so whatever you might see. Um, typically that that is part of our energy agreement and the Honeywell energy agreement. So um, that is a standard thing that you're seeing, you can see every year happen. Uh, fully expended. Uh, they're still in the process of researching and finalizing some of that. And so you'll see that get expended. Um, curriculum supervisors continue to you know, spend through that budget as is what we would expect for this time of the year. Um, and so that's, you know, that's what you might expect. Um, instructional supplies, equipment, miscellaneous, general supplies in the 600s, 610s, 690s, 730s. They're collectively under budget, but that's because we're in the they will spend through those during the year um, as you might expect them to. So that's just you know my general overview. And um, if you have questions, I'll be happy to report them and see what I can do now, but also yeah. answer them and see you or, or otherwise. Because Harmony is one of our members. Everyone's looking at the grids. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Um, Dr. Willett, I mean, we know we have a couple of uh, new members here. High level explain how the encumbrance works, what they're looking at, what we're seeing when we see encumbrance and what we should be expecting. Sure. So you never want to be in a situation where you, you, know, you, you uh, haven't um, allocated enough to it and that you're at the end of the year and your expenses overrun what your expectation was. So encumbering is we know we're going to have to spend X for athletics. You encumber that at the beginning. Um, spend X on salaries. So the, you know, that's not necessarily encumbered, but you'll notice it's negative now because it hasn't been backfilled. It's kind of a similar thing in that we know we're going to expend a certain amount and pay to play fees are going to come in, but we don't want to be in a position where those, those funds are not available. So encumbering says these funds are available for this purpose. Um, and it's, it's a way of accounting so that you're keeping that money for that purpose. Um, if you don't encumber, you might overrun and so it's a counting practice to income. And that's each month. There's 
typically yeah they'll, they'll they try to look out through what they're going to need for, for the whole for the whole fiscal year right and then each, yeah. each month more is put or is taken out of the encumbrance and put towards well, yeah because it's, it's set aside right okay. you know, you'll see those hopefully come together you know what the expenditure and the set aside is perfect um, and i will say um griffin does a great job in our ffc meetings <laughs> of breaking down numbers even if you just want to be a fly on the wall she really walks can through. i just take a stab at that answer okay <laughs> i was trying to so, so, wait a minute. the way i would explain it is range to date is stuff that we've basically been invoiced for or already paid so they're true expenses we already know about it we either paid it or we're about to pay it and comfort is what i would almost call expenses that are accrued we can estimate them pretty to down to the penny they're really not in, they're, i shouldn't say an estimate that's probably the wrong word we know that that's coming it just hasn't been invoiced yet so that's how we get to the balance number so that's kind of the way i kind of look at it the range to date is what we've actually spent physically has should have left our bank account encumbered is what we know is coming because we actually have the invoice purchase order you know whatever budget balance then is truly what is kind of not been accounted for just yet so that's the way that i was like to look at it sorry dr willett but <laughs> <laughs> that was much clearer. <laughs> I mean, you had a good, you had very good. I know it was more to the point. Of. Right. Like, if you think you're going to spend like hundred thousand dollars just say whatever, right? So then you have that hundred thousand for that fiscal year, and then maybe it's fifteen, fifteen, fifteen. But you have to spend within that hundred thousand. Does that make sense? I think he just comes back again. Stick with it. Yeah. So essentially, essentially, we got we got the explanation of, of what the numbers mean. We got the definition of why to encumber from. Right. Yes. So yes. Yeah. So However, I will say her meetings, like if when you if you just even just go to just listen, just to like hear the numbers, then you'll get familiar because it is you're looking at the sheet. You're like, well, okay. <laughs> Thank you. I try to. Thank so it, it is definitely when it comes to my numbers. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have one more question. Um, so in looking at the, the salaries and substitutes, and we've been seeing this throughout, right? Because we've been grossly understaffed when it comes to like substitutes and, and, and those kind of things. So that's why we're under there, but we're over in regular salaries. So I just wanted to talk a little bit more about that. You said the salaries are gonna flatten out a little bit. You'll notice that, for instance, there's a negative right now for salaries. Mm -hmm. That that doesn't mean that. So, to the point of encumbrance, you know you're going to spend X on salaries with X number of people. So that's the set aside. That's the mm -hmm. amount we pull aside for that. It's negative because we don't yet have the funds in from um, the grants yet, and the grants will backfill some of the things that make that negative. Something like the ESSER and ESSER two, ESSER three positions are funded through that that add up to that. Um, Mm -hmm. So we uncovered all that we need from here to the end of the year, so we have enough to pay all our people. But there is going to be a negative balance because those people, some of them, aren't in your budget. That's why they're negative balanced. But that's what ESSER 2 and 3 are for. They're on the understanding that, that the federal government will provide the ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 funds. And then we need to be prepared. So if these folks are still needed post ESSER grants, post CR, the COVID relief fund, somehow roll into our future well the decision would be, have to be made to for Please. instance the right now there are certain positions that end at the end of the year or have to be picked up by the budget which actually be some of the conversation we have next but there are other positions that are through that ESSER 3 allows us to extend that for three years so some of these positions will be paid for for three years right. and will not hit the operating budget some you'd have to make a decision about budget cycle and that's why in a superintendent's budget i'll make recommendations to you um when that comes out and then about a month later you decide as a board you know what you want to do with you know my my proposal to you and what how we get what you keep what you don't and some of them will be some of those positions you know a position that might then be requested to be in the budget for next year that was part of a grant in the past okay thank you sure we're going to close off the snowflake by mutual Went through that off. <laughs> Commissioner.
So um, we update these tuition rates based on experience, and then we report these tuition rates out to the Board of Education. So you'll notice that eight, uh, eight, item H2 um, is in accordance with policy 3070. And we are reporting out the updated tuition rates. Um, because of the pandemic, some of the information for the tuition rates was not as easy to get. So we had to take a little more time to do that. Um, but this is just posting out to the board um, and in its essence by doing so to the public what our tuition rates are um, if kids were tuitioning into the school system, so to speak. So if I was going to bring one of the bullet children into the school system currently at the 9-12 level, it would cost me $17,580. So I won't. But that's not because it's not <laughs> They're very happy where they are, the <laughs> system where they are. But anyway, these tuition rates are not uncommon and they're based generally on the per pupil NC uh, EP data and things like that. So you'll find that most of these per pupil expenditures for districts are in this range, kind of like, you know, around that dollars figure. How many uh, students, Dr. Willett? actually pay these rates. This is, I can't imagine. A whole we don't have a lot of kids tuition yeah. in right now. Okay. Um, and when one comes in, they do pay that rate. Mm -hmm. um, we did have, uh, we had a couple over the last few years that did and, hit, and they come in at those rates. Sometimes we'll have people placed here that also within your curriculum rate level, or I'm sorry, a, a tuition rate level um, where we get that kind of money. Okay. Is there some sort of program in uh, maybe in another district that you're aware of that say they're um, from K through two, they've paid the $16,824 each year that they've gone here. As they continue to go through the school program, if they want to continue going to our school program, is there some sort of program that sort of alleviates any of that or is, or is it flat out the cost of the cost and you mean over they 12 years they're paying out over $100,000, $200,000 for education? Um, so, and, and forgive me because I may not fully understand the question, but if they live, if they live here, you mean, not, and then they move and they want to stay here? As of right, if, if a, a Hartford student did want to come to Tunnel, or a, a family from Hartford did want their child to come to Tunnel, and they are six years old, they're in first grade. Okay, so they're paying $16,824 for that school year. If they decide to keep going, uh, to our school system after that year for whatever it is, four or five years, is there some sort of program because they've been with us for the last however many years that helps alleviate any of that cost or no? Well, so, I mean, H and I'm from another district, which sometimes happens, but not usually. Um, it's different than say a program relationship with, um, you know, with say, um, you know, one of the programs in the state of Connecticut. Um, that are meant to cross districts, increase, you know, diversity and, and things like that. So there are some programs that have, you know, you know, massive benefits that have their own kind of pay structures that I presented on in the past and I can present on in the future for the board. That's not the same as say, um, Mr. Willett bringing his kids over to, you know, to, to um, Howland. So um, the, there's two different paradigms there. One is through a state sponsored program um, in which case it's not, this is not, this right. is not is what is used for that. Um, and the other is um, certain placements that are made that the district must take or if uh, somebody's tuitioning into a lead program or something. Sometimes through an IEP, a district might say, well, we don't have this service, but we know a neighboring district and um, we'd be willing to provide the tuition rate to Talent for taking a student into their program. Gotcha. That's what they would you know, pay or, or some version of that or more. Gotcha. Um, that's a different thing than a state sponsored program. You know, so so there's there's many kind of layers of that question. So hopefully that helped a little bit sure. with it, but I can go into greater detail. Thank you. Just why are there class differences for school? Uh, to go into it, um, it's just as you get up to the to those high, uh, those older programs require more typically in terms of um, uh, just, just resource wise. You know, um, I'd have to get a disaggregation of exactly why, but typically the bigger kids are around longer. They're there for a longer part of the day. They use more of the resources. The facilities used more extensively and in different ways. Um, it's an overall aggregation of the costs of the student for everything else. 
So it just is affected. It does is affected by age and facility too. Uh -huh. Yeah, because it just it looks like three to five is, is the most per year. Yeah. Yeah, and that's based on experience, like what they're spending at that level. Mm -hmm. So it just did, you know, and it can it can be a, a series of factors, but generally it's what they're spending at that level. Any other questions? Okay, so um this is just a primer. Uh, as you get into your further conversations on this, um, you know, you're going to be doing a uh, um, workshop on January 5th um, that I may uh, teleconference and so just watch, grab some popcorn and watch you, but then you're going to eventually have a retreat. And in the retreat, you'll be talking about um, you know, your goals and uh, we'll be talking about your goals. Do is in one place just have that quick conversation for the board as a primer for next month when you presumably will be entering into a ultimately a uh, you know workshop or a retreat. Um, so the board of education goals that are currently in place are at the top of every agenda, um, ensuring the completion and implementation of portrait of graduate, which we're working on, um, and due diligence, fostering a culture and climate that supports high levels of learning and engagement, promotes mental and physical well-being, and and success. There's two, three is assess our district needs and advocate for resources to meet them while pursuing non-traditional sources of income, ensuring a quality education for all students. And four is nurture and support an inclusive community where every person, regardless of identity, is acknowledged and respected. This will ensure that all and students have the necessary resources to thrive at school, in the community, and in our diverse world. So these are your Board of Education goals um, currently. And as you know, looking at those, looking at the, the packet I put together will kind of help you have a foundation for where you might want to go from there. Um, the packet goes over the traditional goal types, and you'll notice that on the left is sort of the traditional historical goal type. On the right are the data that are gathered, um, you know, to, uh, to support that goal or to uh, look for progress towards that goal. So this is meant to just, I'm not going to read every single thing here, but from the the school improvement plan categories of SRBI, so typically research-based interventions, academic category, culture and planning category. This is to give you an idea of on a nitty gritty level what the district tends to have as goals and what the district then might have as data targets for such goals. So it gives you kind of a picture of what teachers and schools might be setting um, as you start to think about what you want the board goals to be. So it's just kind of taking it from the board level and bringing it down in a series of sort of steps process how that's done. Um, then, you know, portrait of a graduate, some of you have been around for that, some weren't. It was a, it's a community activity um, where there's uh, community events and there's also um, school events. Through that process, a portrait of a graduate was created. Um, this portrait of graduate is used with um, our curriculum planning to make sure that, you know, everything we do um, goes towards the end of making sure kids that graduate from the Tahoe public school system um, you know, the, the mission beliefs and, um, and the, um, you know, the portrait of a graduate is a guideline for that. So it's, uh, it's kind of the, it's also the thing we use for um, curriculum development with understanding by design or UBD as you've heard of it. Um, so whenever we're designing curriculum, you know, we're looking at this to make sure that it does provide critical and creative thinking opportunities that we're, you know, they are emphasizing effective, independent, collaborative work or making sure the kids are uh, using and then encountering innovative problem solving and getting innovative problem solving skills, that they're effective communicators, et cetera. So this gives you an idea of um, you know, what we use when we're building the curriculum um, to make sure we're having the graduates uh, leave Tallinn with these desirable outcomes and behaviors. Um, so that's another layer of it. And then as you get to the teacher goals, um, you may recall we, you know, there was the board on a standardized uh, teacher evaluation plan that's about 200 whatever pages and has the traditional way. Um, and then a couple of links on what that looks like and the flexibilities here. So, so you kind of get a sense of where we are this year. We are under the Connecticut's flexibility plan. So teacher goals will look a little different than they typically look. So when you see in the second section of that document, the district goals with those targets, those are traditional. 
that next year. But flexibilities has a little bit more family engagement centered things and you know SEL centered things, and they're much more kind of qualitative ethnographic ethnographic kind of stuff. Um, quantitative data is still collected for academics, and quantitative targets are still made for academics. But you'll notice that the goals have uh, at least half of the focus is on these um, engagement, family engagement, social emotional pieces, and that's all part of flexibility. Uh, I tried to provide basically a starting point for uh, board members to grab a cup of coffee and just kind of go through it so that when you come in in January, you have a picture of like what it traditionally looks like, what it looks like under flexibilities, what the board's goals were, what the district's goals typically were with that. Um, and this process in a normal year, so for next year, for instance, is usually happening in September, October. You just, your election's November and everything like that. So you actually are process with that this year, but you wouldn't normally do. That's why your goals kind of roll into it. But next year as a board, you can start to set your board goals in the summer. And those board goals can be set prior to the beginning of our goal process. And then September and October, that, that would you know kind of flow that way. This year you didn't really have that opportunity as much. Um, and then you know so there's there's some um, you know, there may be some things you want to do this summer that uh, because you don't have you know, such shifts happening or things changing with them. Um, so that's it from a helicopter point of view. Then just one last piece is the flexibilities document changes how admin also are doing things this year a bit. So you'll notice that the traditional district goals that you took, you know, that are section two, when you get to flexibilities, you'll see how that kind of looks section five under flexibilities. And that's it. Uh, I just wanted to make sure you had a sense of all the pieces um, you know, in five minutes, so or ten, and uh, and that's it. So that this document is looked this is designed for you to to percolate on and, and be able to then think about what you want to part, you know, how you want to frame things in January when you get together for your retreat. Any questions or regards to presentation? Yeah, I think. Thank you, Dr. Willett. Let's go ahead and uh, move on to the budget considerations. I was trying to get the technology to cooperate. So, second. Um, <clears throat> so, what I intend to do tonight is essentially give you sort of a helicopter view of exactly where I am in my process. Um, the to you know be looking at some of these things as we you know transition, um, you know, from the planning you know, and gathering of information stage to implementation. In early January, um, I provide to the Board of Education the superintendent's proposed budget, and I'll be talking about that as we're moving through, um, you know, through the next uh, period of weeks with the FFC as well, or, or trying to do that in the circumstances. The big lift, the heavy lift from the board side is the superintendent's proposed budget to the Board of Education budget that month is a heavy lift month for um, uh, for the board. And so the kind of things, I just want to give you a sense of the kinds of things that are coming up right now on my radar. Um, so then in FFC, we can talk about that. And uh, ultimately, when you have to do the heavy lift of coming up with your budget, um, you know, you have sort of an idea of it from. So um, trying to get... So I just I'm trying to give you a sense uh, with no dollar figures attached here. When I have meetings um, on on the budget, um, you know I sit down with all the departments and um, all the all the principals, all the leadership staff, and they give me everything that they feel they need for their school. So I'm not going to go on and read everything here. I did provide it so the board can take a look at it and it's going to be on the dashboard for your reflection. But just so you know you get a sense of it, um, these are all positions that have been asked for and the explanation for why on the right side. Um, and then here the second consideration is essentially um, program program requests. And so um, the position requests 
uh, go paraprofessionals in each each board member should also if you're looking in the hybrid board meeting kind of folder you should be this is something you can see but i'll be putting on the back too um, so the 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 main juxta of uh, these are intervention and supporting kids so there's you know intervention support requests for intervention paras um, reading paras math paras um, there are library support the um, academic lab support request being made, um, counseling. You know, the one of the positions this year that transitions over to operational is the for two or three years the counselor that you know we brought in through a grant that I wrote and also another um, that skills for adolescents and so and uh, counselor is now one that we would you know that, that I would put into my superintendent's budget um, because it's uh, desperately needed um, at the and so we've been funding that for years and now this it would be a time to transition um, business teacher for adding finance personal finance course technology teacher because we have 13 courses offered and two teachers uh, social studies teacher um, there's a new u.s african-american and latino uh, history class um, that is added to state um, you know you may remember that the state passed a law that had that added to school systems and so we do in the course catalog kids will be signing up for it and um, we would have to pull social studies teachers out of other classes in order to teach that if we don't hire a social studies teacher um, and just keeping in mind social studies classes in general are you know average sizes of 28 26 25 they're one of the loaded you know they're loaded so having another social studies teacher makes sense anyway but um that we would need that to cover those sections where we're going to lose other things teachers will, will have to reassign them so that's you know that's why that that is probably something as we're talking about it in the superintendent's budget you'll probably see the request for the council you'll probably see the request for social studies business because i know the board has been interested in personal finance you may see a request for a business teacher um, because that you know that would add allow us to add that as a as potential required class um you also um we'll see Worker, um, we we are desperately in need of facilities assistance. So you may see that in there, um, and then you may see a smattering of paraprofessionals for reading and math support to continue to provide those reading and math support intervention um, activities. And um, at the youngest grades right now, you know the kids have been uh, impacted and will continue to be impacted for a few years. Just even academic behaviors. Um, you know, like if my kids spent a year quarantined with me, the, they're probably leaving swearing and other things. <laughs> so, you know, the issue is that there's just a lot of like an adjustment of academics and behaviors as the kids come up through that, that we need to help adjust and we need the parents, they'll help us make those adjustments so that the kids are ready to learn. So we need help getting the kids ready to learn. And that's where those parents would come in um, with the reading and math and things like that to learn so when they're in that classroom they're able to we're able to move forward with the same pacing that we need to move forward to so um i would say right now you know as you go through this and the board goes through this you'll get a really good handle on you know you you'll you won't be surprised about what i'm asking for in the superintendent's budget when you look at this because you'll see there's a lot of stuff here that we can't possibly do all of this there's no way we could do all of this but you'll notice that what i out of this is core critical things. So as Ms. Galachan was asking about SEL, that uh, skills for adolescents and counselor at the middle school, integral, super important for that. Um, you know, social studies, we're going to have to reduce all these other sections um, if we don't do it, and they're already overloaded. So having a social studies teacher makes sense. Um, facilities, our facilities people are working harder than any facilities people I see anywhere on the planet. It's kind of unfair. So we need to look at, and you'll, I, I feel very confident when I show you all the information and data around that, that you're going to look at that and go, yeah. So I'm gonna hand you a superintendent's budget that I think will be difficult you know, to, to, to look at and go, oh yeah, I, I think we do know those things. There are other things on here that you know, we can't do at all. So 
Um, you know, I, I find being completely straightforward. You know, there's uh, there's some stuff here that you know I do right now um, in terms of um, you know, library support and stuff like that. It's it's something that is needed, but not something that is as needed as say math or reading for a para. So um, you know, my foci would be in the math and the reading and the facilities and the you know and the social studies and the business and the school counseling and the SEL and all of that. Um, and that's where the core stuff has to be for a superintendent. So you'll, you'll see that that making its way into the budget. When um, we talk about teachers, your average cost of a teacher at an MA3, which is master's level three, which is pretty much where you hire people at typically as teachers, you have to give some allowance for that. MA7 is even more safe, but MA3 is, you know, you're looking at about 50,000 to 52,000 per teacher. So if you're looking at 50 to 52,000 per teacher and you're looking at a couple of teachers, there's a possibility of that adding up quick. So you, you know, you got all into consideration and balance it with what the community can afford. You'll also note that special education, as I scroll down, moving from a personnel conversation to a program budget conversation, what I did here is I put the percentages in of um, each of these budgets are higher than last year by that percent. So Birch Grove is 7%, Colin, uh, TIS 40%, TMS 54%, THS 30%. Uh, food services is not in our budget anyway, but it's breaking even. Um, ELA about 37, math is high, um, but uh, in science 32%, ITET 64%. But when you look at why, um, for instance, the uh, information technology ET is 64% increase, but we knew in fiscal year 23, we would start to absorb the educational technology initiative and start to replace some of these phone books. Don't do that, then they fail somewhere along the line and it creates a bigger problem later. So in our cycle, we have to start um, doing that unless we wanna fund it through the ERF, in which case the ERF then you know, you have to, we have to be mindful of what we have in the ERF and how we use it. One of the things you can use ERF for is technology. So FFC can have a conversation. Would we rather put this, you know, this better in the budget or do we want to look at this as a cap, as a technology expense out of the ERF? Okay, that is 24% of the increase in IPET is the Educational Technology Initiative devices. And that, that was starting in fiscal year 23. I know it's hard to believe, but when we, were start, when we were talking about this years ago, that was like way back in 2020, we are arriving at 2023 when the first wave of updating these things was going to happen. So that's why you see that up there. Things like um, math, math is up by 119%, but if we went with not restoring investments, it would be up by 10%. So math is up by a high amount, but it's up by a high amount because we're restoring the investments we made. We, we remember that that was going to come to roost at some point for us. There's an advantage to doing it in one year, but in the next year, you end up having to then um, come up from where you artificially were. were. And so at this point, um, that would be 10% otherwise, but it's 19% because we would be needing to do that. Um, same thing for ELA, it's 37% up, but it's 37% up because there's a good big chunk of that, um, probably about 25% that is um, you know, restoring investments that were made in the fiscal year 22 year. Um, special education is just up, that's it, it's 15%. That's how that kind of, it ebbs and it flows and it's up. Um, High school, 80% of what they're asking for is recovery, recovering investments that, you know, put that um, baseline lower. So of the 13% increase at that high, at the high school, 80% of that increase is recovery. And we projected that. We projected that about 160 to 200,000 was gonna be recovery items. And that is what it is roughly. So, um, you know, same thing common intermediate, you're looking at, um, Math workbooks and Spanish Excel program and special education items like Lexia. Um, but these renewals that were taken um, and used investment funds for, those renewals now look like they're climbing up higher than they actually were because we, we did use investment methods. So 
What we have coming to us this coming year is a series of things to consider with respect to restoring investment that we made in fiscal year 20 into 21, I'm sorry, 21 into 22, that now we in 23 have to restore in order to reach parity. We have things that are on the radar for staff. For instance, if we do want to make personal finance a required course, the business person would be part of that. Maybe that's not what we want to do next year per se, but maybe it is. And those are the conversations that we have. Um, and then we have other things like social studies that will be an actual hit. You know, you will or you will lose other things if we do not hire someone in social studies because that class is required um, to be held. People will sign up for it. It's a great class, by the way, wonderful class. People will sign up for it. People teaching it have to come off of what they're teaching now to teach it. So that will happen. There will be classes lost if we don't pass that in our budget. You know? So like, you know, so there's a kind of a weighing of what is more important than something else because that is the Sophie's choice that you to me and then ultimately to you. Um, so the, you know, the um, purpose of putting the program budget, um, uh, put program budget data in here is to give you a sense of where it's at at this moment in time. And what kinds of considerations that are going through my mind as I start to build the superintendent's proposed budget that I present to you. And then you ultimately decide what you want to do with it and make your board of ed adopted budget out of it. Um, the kinds of things I am looking to for uh, some efficiencies. So, the wrong direction. <laughs> you know, this is weird. This is about as big as it gets. But those of you at home actually have an advantage. You'll be able to see it better. We can't see it. Well, that's why my hand is raised. I can't see what you're you're presenting. I think my whole thing is all messed up after okay back on. It's just not. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, thank you for me. So um, at the end of this is the kinds of things I look to to offset what is usually coming like a freight train at us with respect to you know, the considerations in the budget that we would have to be thinking about that might raise it. Um, I look constantly for grant opportunities. Um, in this district, I write them. Um, the director of people services writes them, a few others write them, but we write a, we write a lot of grants. Some entitlements some of them are not but we are we have hundreds of thousands of dollars of grants that we write and obtain and so i would be seeking any potential grant opportunities we could to offset it they're never a guarantee with the, with the exception of some entitlements um, they're never a full guarantee but they will help us um, program innovations you know we already know the cpa and things like that they do help we would have more children in tuition programs without these, and these help kids stay in the town. And so there is a, the superior educational opportunity provided by these awesome programs and their teachers. There's also cost avoidance, and those are methodologies that we've used under Lighthouse for years. We are going to look for any and all redundancies. If I can find any kind of redundancy, I would then be looking to make an efficiency of the redundancy, and that was what I'll be looking for. To know opportunities, we do encourage people to let us know if they're retiring, because if you retire at uh, your highest step and we're able to hire an MA3 to replace you, there is a cost differential that will allow us to reduce the budget by that differential, which is why it's wonderful to have people tell us they're retiring before the budget process is complete, which is why we do try to sweeten out a little bit so they let us know because they save us you know, $30,000 in a position that you say to somebody tells us. So that is, a, we're going to be looking to make sure that we get all that data and that that happens prior and that can help um, bring the budget number down. And insurance considerations. I did have a meeting today where we had our first kind of flyover of that. We do not have those numbers yet, so I'm not going to even, you know, try to conjecture on it. But um, you are part of a ECHIP consortium, um, basically a consortium of to come together, you're self-insured. And so we have a lot of ability and flexibility, but we still do have to follow trend in numbers. So the first meetings on that, where that might land happen today. Um, it's not bad news. 
Um, the problem is that it's still, you know, what's going to come down in the future is people still are putting off elective surgeries and things because of COVID. And in about a year or two, once COVID stabilizes, they will not be doing that anymore. So they'll have a flood of people coming in to do stuff they're not doing now, but benefits right now. So the rates may be favorable for us and that may help us. So these efficiencies, opportunities, and offsets might uh, be good countermeasures to the things that you are going to have coming on the radar. Um, you know, like that social studies teacher, like that facilities person, like some of those para support positions, that type of thing. So the superintendent's proposed budget will look to have as many potential efficiencies, opportunities, and offsets as possible to be aware of prior to the time that I presented to you in the FFT. Um, but then the Board of Ed ultimately will have that month to decide through a series of meetings what you want to what you want to do with it, what you want to keep, what you don't want to keep, um, et cetera. So that's where we are right now. Um, but I wanted to give you a sense of that. You know. I already have a question. Well, <laughs> um, I thought the literacy thought we were completing with it. Now I see that it's listed under a sunset program. Well, I'm calling it sunset because it, it is going to eventually be, you know, not needed anymore. But remember, literacy how is around because it's needed and it's phonics. So but I thought we had the individual come and train our teachers to implement it. That program is not yet fully complete. And that's something that's an educational professional call. You know, if we cut it, we cut the ability to piece and that's what our educational professionals are saying is needed for now is did they just not get to the whole thing because it's of not the, the, the need is not fully completed or fulfilled yet and we're still we still need we don't need as much right now right now the foci is you know the bgpcis level but um again you know how this gets in there is i have supervisors who are professionals in this area say we need this and you know and i'll say okay but uh, we're on our way some point, yes, but we're not there yet. And so then I put it in, you know, um, and I trust them. And and what you what is hard to see from a from a historical here is we are so much better off now than we were. And the reason is because of stuff like this, like foundations, literacy, how um, dyslexia um, came on the radar very heavily in the last five, you know, ten years. The state came out with a lot more of what it expects, and it became and phonics and with um you know with it, if we're not able to show that we are providing um these kinds of program developments um you know we are compromised when we go to hearings or we go to um you know, we're compromised first of all because we're not serving kids as well but then if we are in a hearing and they say well, what do you do for phonics what do you do for you know this or that in your you know typical program if we can't point these out Will look like we are failing in those areas, and that will not go in our favor. If somebody's saying, "I want X, Y, and Z services," I want um, these consultants brought in to, to serve my children. You know, if we're not having that done with trained people ourselves, we're going to end up paying for it from someone else, sent by a crack, sent by ACEs, sent by something else. I just, you know, that was one of the first things that stood out to me because we were discussing that, but, and I noticed that we began to title the subset program. Kind of sound like we're going to return. Yeah, well, sunsetting is my word. The reason I say that is I know that probably what you're looking for is an exact date where this ends, and that is not possible to get. So I can tell you that, you know, the program has, has you know, has had an arc and is continuing to, you know, to be needed. But it's not like, you know, um, it's not like you can pull the plug on something before it's, it's, it's you know, need has ended. Because if you do, the, you know, you cost the district something or the children something that are being served by. So we've, I know that somehow literacy how, these two words have been something that has attracted the attention of people for some time. And it's been a certain perplexity of mine, just kind of, why literacy how? <laughs> there's a lot of things, you know, there's bridges, there's a hundred of these kinds of things, but literacy how is actually one of those ones that's really prevented us from having any other problems. So, um, you know, Somebody might say, I want a drop dead date where that ends. I can't, if I were to try to give you that, I would be compromising something. 
No, and, and I understand yeah. that. It's just the fact that, you know, when we're going through the budget two years, it's like, you know, we're going to have a year for this, a year for the special, and then a year for the general population. It, it just is one of those programs that we started with when we first came on board. And so then it's like, you're still seeing it. And it's like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, so that's, that's, that's all. Year, I mean, yeah. I know we're going to have, you know, definitely more discussions on this. Let's go ahead, uh, Tony. I guess I just want to key in and literacy how bridges or whatever else is on the, the list of 100 is, you know, while I understand that you can't say on this date it's going to be over, other than saying what do we need, I mean, how are we tracking, how are we forecasting when we think those things are going to be? Uh, well, essentially, it's, it's, it's in student performance and also how we feel uh, will measure up if about how, you know, what we're doing for these programs when we are um, in a bank hearing or in another place where we have to show that we've developed these skills and these kids and then we have programs to continue to develop those skill sets in both the teaching of it and in the receiving of that instruction by the kids. So, you know, essentially we pay our curriculum supervisors to keep us out of hot water and to keep the kids educated. And if I have, a, you know, one of them turn to me and say, yeah, these kids for this reason, um, I, I would not look at that as a superintendent and say, um, foolish person, no, we do not. You know, I would say, explain to me why. And the why is typically in, these have been core programs for helping the kids with, um, you know, their competencies and in showing that the district is addressing the issues of children um, that need help in phonics, that need help with, um, you know, that are, we are addressing the things that can contribute to uh, condition when dealing with dyslexia. So, you know, if we don't do these things, you know, we open up a lot more opportunities for the district to pay out more um, because we have to pay for those services elsewhere um, and or we notice that the kids aren't performing as well. You'll notice that one of the places that they're performing pretty well, even though the pandemic has hit, is ELA. So you'll find that um, as I show you more data, because um, I'm just to get moments, I'm thinking this uh, this new way of showing you this data for performance, um, you'll notice the ELA data is pretty good. You know, like they're nailing it in many places. Um, we are covering the basis for dyslexia pretty well. And when we get into IEPs and DPTs, I think that's evident. Um, that's what you want your district to be doing. Because if you're not doing that, you will end up in- well, I guess what, what, what I'm focused on, you know, if not the, the programs that we say we need to be doing to maintain a certain level, but if the are temporary. You know, at, at what point do we take a temporary program that we continue doing and say, no, that that's actually something that's a part of our system that's permanent, as opposed to just dangling each year that we may not need? I'm not sure anything in education is permanent. So, you know, uh, Columbia had the Readers and Writers Workshop. For a long time, ODAs, you know, on-demand assessments and these things were the way to do writing, the way to do this. Then as led and they determined that this actually, you know, there was a threshold here and it wasn't actually the, you know, the best way for kids, for instance, that might you know, be suffering from different things. Um, Lucy Calkins, you know, one of the people that was a big, that was a big um, name in this, that, that ended up looking like it was not going to be as, um, as good for kids. And I'm trying to remember with, you know, which, which population, but that it, that it really wasn't going to be the best way to do this in the long, long run as about some of these other things. So, you know, just like many other things, there's, there's the engine until there's the better engine. And so, you know, these programs are based on the literature and the research at the time that they are built and presented. Eventually, um, these programs will either evolve into even stronger versions of themselves or they'll be replaced by something else because literature and research showed that something was more effective or better at serving um, just like research on early vaccinations and those types of things got replaced by new technologies and new ways of looking at it. APA, AERA, um, ASCD, all these groups are doing and presenting and publishing research along the way about practices and they improve. So there is no such thing as something that exists in perpetuity. And you what you're saying is that when we're looking at these programs and anticipating it being a year, maybe two can't expect that to be the end. We have to assume that it could 
and probably will continue. Yeah, it's, about that, about it's never the program, in, in my opinion, in my opinion, somehow these, this program, Literacy How, got on the radar of the board and that it has then been this thing that like, like some you know, kind of look at it proverbially as a tick. You know, this thing is stuck on us. How soon, how can we get this thing off us as soon as possible? Sucking our blood. Sucking our blood. You know, it is a program and there are many others. There's a reason for its existence. And when that reason is no longer needed, you know, when that is no longer needed, our educational professionals will tell us that. Mm -hmm. um, and if we mess with that, we mess with that with our own you know, under our own peril. So you know that's why um, there is no such thing as a program in education or, or anywhere else on the planet that doesn't eventually get replaced by another program. And theoretically, and hope in literature that ultimately leads us to replace one program with another. How long a program sticks with us and stays with us and is needed with us. I, I personally believe that needs to be, um, you know, we need to heavily rely on the professionals we hire to tell us that, you know, yes, this is needed or no, it is not. And that doesn't mean that it goes without challenge. I mean, part of my job is to challenge things and I challenge them all the time. That's why this job is quite a lonely job because at one point or another, you have for one reason or another. And those reasons are usually because you're challenging things like this. Um, but you'll find that you know something like diversity. How I can't give you an exact date that it ends. I think people wanted me to, but I can't possibly give you an exact date because I have to listen to them and the benefit. And my first priority is always going to be two things: one, children, because that's what I'm here for. But two, if I think you're going to face a greater impact financially or otherwise, program or just having it, then I'll always suggest that we have the program. <laughs> Uh, because I'll think that you're going to pay out more. So for instance, you know, SLPs, um, we couldn't find them. You know, you're much better off with your own. Um, if you have to pay crack aces or any of these places for your SLPs, you'll pay way more than what you're paying now. And we had that model a few years ago where we would pay for people coming, you know, as consultants from here and there. How that helps you is they don't show up in your FTEs. They're usually more expensive. So you can, you know, not have them on your FTEs, but you're paying more than you would have been paying if you had them on your FTEs. So sometimes it feels nicer to nest them away as services and provided services and all that, but you're actually paying more. So this is an example where, you know, you don't invest um, 15,000, 25,000, you know, for this school or that school, 50,000, you know, one point, um, you know, one, so if I, you don't invest in those, you're going to pay for them anyway, because somebody's going to require services because you didn't have that or need services, and you're not going to be able to demonstrate that you've adequately provided, and you'll pay it anyway. So, you know, that's the kind of thing, and that's part of my job is to try to help you avoid those kind of pitfalls and those holes. So that means I can't possibly give you an exact date where it will disappear. And I could definitely say to somebody, we're not doing that next year, but if the, if the, we will, you know, the kids will be hurt by that, and you're not going to, you know, you may be in peril because you're going to have to pay off this, that, or the other thing, then, I, then I'll put it in there. You know, at the end of the day, you can say, I want this slice, but I want this slice. And I will say to you, you know, I think you know me to, to be candorous. <laughs> I'll say, okay, mm -hmm. if that's what the board wants, here's what might happen from that. And if you want me to track it, I can then come up with every instance between that point and the next year, you know, the year lose money on those things um, but that's why we do some of the stuff we do and we bring things in the way we bring them in i just have another couple of quick questions because i'm just now that you scrolled up to that part is there a way that we can kind of advertise for the library support being that we can get some parent volunteers um i know at some point jerry used to get parents that come in and help put away the books and mm -hmm. things of that nature are we just short on volunteers I, I would not, I mean, I know this is, I, I just, you know, I like to be upfront. I would not add this to the budget because I think we can find ways to do that. The problem is, and I do understand this perspective, um, it's not consistent. Like, you know, when you have someone working for you, you can tell them to index this, do this, do that, do that. There's a whole workload thing. When you're dealing with a volunteer, you really don't feel like you can do that to them and they will not be able to put in the hours and they will sporadically assist. You know? And assist a couple hours a week to do 
X, Y, and Z, then most people don't want to put a certain kind of burden on your volunteers, whereas as a staff member, it's their expectation that you put that burden on them. So um, they are doing the right thing. Those buildings are asking for people that will support their libraries because those librarians teach, and that is an extremely important thing. But I wouldn't put that in front of a math person or a reading person or some, especially after the pandemic, there's a time for that I, now. However, um, when volunteers do become part of our, you know, allowed thing again, when we get them back in, which is not far off, but it's not right around the corner either, I do think they can help in libraries. So that's why I would not probably do that. Okay, so that doesn't mean they don't need it though. They're right to ask and they do need it. And I understand that. I just know that, like I said, um, just the volunteering put away books and things of that nature. I know that that has been a volunteer kind of position to help out the library. The question is on a couple of these that are on here, I would have thought that they're already on staff, but perhaps maybe they're not filled with a staff member or are these added positions? No, these are these are not. Well, first of all, none of these are added because they're not part of our budget yet. Right? No, no, but, but they're requested. They're requested. These are requested just, above and beyond what we have. Even like that first one, the full time ten month pair for the lunch recess supervision and support. I mean, I know sometimes I used to just go in half day and just knock out the lunch and recess duties, and then that would be it. Yeah. So I didn't know if that was necessarily something that they just don't, can't find someone. Or if it's... Well, there's definitely the problem of not being able to find someone. That is definitely a problem here, but it's here everywhere else too. <laughs> Let's say that you could find someone. I think what they're looking to do is find a reliable methodology. So a substitute you can assign, but you may not be able to because you may have your subs fully utilized. You know, and right now we're feeling that you know in particular because of the you know, illnesses dependent on that. But um, in general, when it's not a para, it's someone else. So you're either filling that hole with a sub, trying to figure out how to do that each day, or it's going to be the administrator, or it's going to be someone assigned, or we'll pay a you know, teacher may pay something more if they're going beyond their day. So the point is, it ends up and probably the cost of that individual in the long, long term, um, which is why it's there. But you know, um, but it can be covered through other ways. It's just going to cost more. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. um, so a couple of things, I don't know if it's more of a question or a statement, but um, some of the things that I heard you talking about, Dr. Willett, that are kind of concerning coming up to budget season is the pre-investment quote that we made that we're going to have to restore in the next budget. So it's going to look like we're grossly overspending because it's going to swing the pendulum to well, offset those pre-investments. The, you know, whenever any, any uh, the methodology of investing, you know, is not necessarily a bad idea because it does help you in the budget year that you're in. Mm -hmm. It's just that when we do it, which I think that was soberly, you know, was sober, we did know, you mm -hmm. know that, that right. decision was made in the year with the knowledge that, that the year after there would be some climbing up from that. Mm -hmm. And the hope is that, you know, some other adjustments, you know, over time would occur in the budget that might, you know, make that impact a little less. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as I go through this, if there are grants, if there are things, you know, I'll be trying to pick everything out that I can, but, um, but some of these things will, will naturally be something we had to restore. So um, that was kind of was not have a, a loss of staff last year that we might have otherwise had. Right. Right. So that's a positive. Um, but that, you know, it does eventually come back. All right. Um, two more things really quick. And then with, I mean, I know we, like you said, we really focus on literacy how, because I remember that was our big conversation when we bought our first thing. But again, what I heard when you were talking about programs, whether it's literacy how or what have you, is these programs continually, you get recertified for something, you have your continual training, within your respective job duties, right? And as different requirements change and as learning is absorbed and changes with the students, the program itself has to evolve, right? So there's gonna be constant training. And so whether it be literacy or whatever, having that training and that program structure available to our staff to continue to evolve is gonna be paramount. But 
as that program or something evolves into something else, it sounds like these programs are going to continue to be in our budget. So it's not like we're going to have something sunset or be removed from the budget. It's ultimately going to have something else that's going to come in to continue to evolve our training program. Am I understanding that correctly? And, and, yes. and, so and I, yeah, sorry. There will always be right. programs. And, and part of the nature of my job is to sift out the BS from pro, you know, program. So, you know, when you do have, um, when we go to certain superintendents things, one of the big um, pet peeves I have is I'm expecting a, a training and a meeting and it ends up being 30% somebody selling a product to the superintendents, which is my aversion. So, you know, there are so many things we cast away that we don't just grab onto, but you also see things that we never had to deal with before that we do. So for instance, true note budget. As an administrator, I could just write up my evals and write them up on paper through Word, create a you know, system for that. But this is going to work pretty well. Then the state said, you must do this electronically. Mm -hmm. Then it said, you must do this through one of our vendors. And now we pay $20,000 a year for true note logic that we'd never had to pay for. Now that's a program evolution I'd rather not have, you know, mm -hmm. but that's the kind of thing that you're picking up so many things that you didn't used to have that mm -hmm. makes things that are actually valuable, like literacy, that, you know, look like something you want to knock off. Right. But the truth of the matter is you're carrying a bunch of stuff that you never had to carry before. Uh, PMT training. When I started as a teacher um, and an admin, I didn't have to get certified every other year in physical management. But now you're required. So people have to get PMP training. They have to be re upped, and you have to, you know, so that's how to do holds and, and keep people under certain circumstances restrained uh, so they don't right. hurt themselves. You have to be certified in that and get recertified. That's thousands of dollars. Like, you know, there's all, so the irony is these are things that are hitting the system. And then you got stuff that teaches kids phonics, you know, that helps you avoid problems with dyslexia. And they become the things that are in our crosshairs, but there's a lot of other stuff that's bleeding away that has nothing to do with that. So, you know, I'd almost want to try to see if we get the state to let go of certain things versus, you know, we, you know, us having to do Sophie's choice on some programs that help kids. But to go back to the point, there will always be an evolution or change of mm -hmm. something else. So while we do not have Columbia workshops, you know, a OD, you have to do an ODAs. And, we're not doing all the stuff from the Reader's Writers Workshop, and Lucy Hawkins is now antiquated. Um, we've replaced that with things that are, you know, that the research has shown are more effective, and that's the process. So the, these words you're hearing now are, you know, these programs are the, they are standing on the shoulders of the programs that came before them. And there is an evolution. They are better. Dyslexia, we're doing much better to serve students with dyslexia than when I was in school. But, um, and that is, that is because of these leapfrogging program after program, evolution after evolution, but you're always gonna have them. We're always gonna be coming or asking for some programs. And there's always gonna be a balance. Do we get the program or do you hire more staff? And it's gotta be right. both. You know, we would do a little bit more, uh, you know, the programs, we may not have any staff in this area, you know, et cetera. But paying for those, there it is, Literacy Howard, the next one down the road that he evolved in, is cost avoidance for outplacement or other programs needed for something that we were able to kind of spearhead right at the get-go. So again, although we're funding these programs and they're part of our budget, it's really avoiding other costs of outplacement or other things that can incur yeah, the, if we didn't the, have these programs the in the first, structure. The first thing is that they're the, they're the best thing for kids. But hired to, to do it or, or saying this should be a part of the picture. They also help us when we're having hearings or conversations about what we're doing so that it's not then imposed upon you what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and that does happen. You know, another example would be, you know, if you don't invest in bridges, you end up doing your own. And how do you do your own? Well, the teachers don't just like carelessly do their own. You're going to have to pay them to develop it in curriculum and you're going to pay them at their hourly number of teachers necessary to develop it. And by the time you're done doing all of that, you could have just brought in the program that was shown in research to have a great benefit. Like bridges. So the, the issue is there's there's a hundred ways to make it look like you know we're being hard on things and not doing it and you know being fiscally whatever. But if you don't invest in these things, you're going to pay in other ways for them. Now not all things are like that. AKA you'll hear me being even if it isn't what people want to hear, 
you'll hear me being pretty direct in this. I don't think library fairs are appropriate at that level because I think there's other ways to do it. Not everybody agrees, not everybody's happy with that. But I would rather spend that money on Literacy How than on library fairs for those things because Literacy How has been shown research wise to have a great effect for kids at that level and avoid um, different other impacts for the district. Um, so, you know, these are things you'll hear me be quite frank about, but, um, you know, that is going to be a part of the picture and it's always going to be, you know, do you want your business person or your social studies person? One can do personal finance, one can um, make it so you're not losing AP social studies stuff. Which one do we want? We can't have both, you know, but either way, I'd still want you know, literacy how, because I have supervisors that are better skilled than I am in those areas saying this is what's needed right now. And the data does bear that out. And it has, you do see in ELA, our kids are far better off. Mm -hmm. We are serving them years ago. That's because of these things, you know, that they're doing. Um, and uh, and I, I mean, you can see that in the data, we'll continue to see that in the data. So that's, you know, you also see the investments we're making in math right now, bridges and things like that. You will see the effects of that. We have seen the effects of not having that. We will see the effects of having it. Um, so that's the point. So um, it's a Peter Paul thing all the time. But, you know, it, it is interesting to pick. And I'm just yeah. saying it's not, you know, it, it, it won't be around forever, but it's going to be very hard to tell you exactly when that, that ends. But I do think that it's, you know, within the trajectory of your time, probably on the board, which you'll see it go. Mm -hmm. By the way, you'll probably see it replaced, but something, somebody will have some need. The state requires more for dyslexia than it ever did before. And that required us re-upping a whole bunch of other stuff. That was actually good because it helped serve students that are in that situation not serving adequately before across the entire state of Connecticut, but it did require investment in programs in order to do that. And those are programs that have names and those names sound, you know, like things that maybe you don't want, but they do, they do have a negative impact if you get rid of them. And then when will we, if this is getting uploaded to the dashboard, right? I don't know if I missed when you're gonna have that pop up. No, it is, but I, before I do anything like uh, extensive, I want the FFC, I kind of want to do some information to them and then you'll, Will be uploaded, but ultimately the, the superintendent's proposed budget that ends up landing, you know, in For, January, yeah. and you get to do whatever you want with that, you know. Well, curious eyes, and I just can't see it that far. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but this does not represent what I am. I'm not recommending this. I'm oh, just, okay. I'm letting you know this is what's sitting in front of me right now. Understood. When I, you know, roll my my chair away from my desk after all these meetings, that's what was thrown at me these positions and so you'll see that if that is everything we did your budget would be in the you know, well yeah 10, 15 percent zone and all that you'll see a budget coming in in a you know you know manageable zone that the town can support etc cetera, etc cetera, and it can't have all of that and so you know that'll be the process that goes from here to the superintendent proposed is taking a look at all those meaningful and you know in, in good and saying no, 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 yes, no, yes, no, no, yes, no, and then you see the superintendent's proposed budget, and then you say to me, no, no, yes, no. <laughs> but, but, you know. Quick question: When is that um, FFC meeting that they will be reviewing this? Well, the next one that we have is the next one where I'll be giving them everything that I can. So. January nineteenth is our next meeting. So you probably would be chewing at that point on the superintendent's proposed budget and just beating it up. Well, you will have the F1 by then and things like that. So they have a lot to chew on. And I'll be, I should be back mentally online early to January to have conversations. When is the first budget? When's, when are you presenting your budget? I think that's well? the 12th. Like the, it is that second week in January. And then you have a whole month to kind of chew on it. You have a series of these meetings mm -hmm. and you have FFC as well. So you have a series of meetings to chew on it, figure out what you want to do. That's you. That at that Q and A thing is active right now. You could actually use it now, but you tend to use it much more extensively after the superintendent's proposed has been there, and then you throw at me, you know, why this, why that, why four seven four, why this, you know, I, I I'll post it in one place for the whole board as you get to your deliberations. 
Yeah, yeah, I just had a new newbie question or two. Um, back, you, this was about 30 minutes ago, so I've been writing down notes from you've been speaking, but um, I think you said facilities in when discussing um, budget, no, we're on budget considerations right now. It, it was maybe in the uh, monthly financial report. Um, what did you mean by facilities? Um, I wish I had the context now, but. Uh, you mean in this in the context of the conversation we're having? Right. I do feel that we need another facility for for meaning. It is the guy. It is your your woman or man who drives around basically. And these facilities, individuals, they are usually trained as electricians, trained as um, master key people. There, you know, we train our people, and then you don't pay for the locksmith. And you know, you don't the way you would otherwise electrical. One of our facilities individuals is um, certified and does a lot of the electrical and things like that. Um, you know, we do a lot of in-house work. And so those individuals end up saving money for the district. In any case, we have been running on three people for a long time. And that's not really the best model. So I anticipate that we will have some structural changes that will allow us to get uh, and then 1.0 FTE for the price of a 0.5 FTE for this job. Um, but it's, you know, we still, we need to go up to the equivalent of 3.5 with this. Oh, and I have methods for balancing that. So, you know, those, those are forthcoming at a certain point. I don't have all the pieces in place, hopefully by the different kind of budget. Um, you know, we can add and get at least half of 25 facilities, in, you know, more in our overall FTE, but this request is 1.0 person. And it'll become more obvious later why and how that falls. But let's put it this way, it's a 1.0 for like 0.5 cost. But I think we can do that. Anyway, we need another facilities person because the people that were asking to do that job are, in my opinion, overwhelmed right now. I mean, it's a lot. And then what happens um, when staff doesn't warn you of retirement? Where does that extra 13, 14, however, whatever the difference is between that? It can 40, end up in your uh, end of year balance. And that gets and that Yeah. Gotcha. So like the, the hard part about that is it's much better to know early because I'd rather save a position than have money roll that way because you need the position. You know, like if we go through a tough budget season, you know, season and we were able to save some jobs through the differentials from the retirements to the MA3 hires, then you keep your district with as many people that you need in the classroom. We didn't have to, to cut people you know, because of budget implications. So in in June and gives us a retirement, I usually bang my head against the wall because that's money that is now pretty much just, you know, that was an opportunity we lost to offset um, an impact to the district. And once something happens in June, if you're hiring in an MA3, you know, those, those money is somewhere in that zone. If there is something differential wise, your budget's already done. So, you know, you, you may, that depends on the situation. Okay. Set a situation, you know, you're the you may not have been able to help something you could have otherwise helped. Okay, let's go to the floor. Thank you. Um, thanks for this, Dr. Willett. Um, I guess my only thought is, and forgive me if, if you had said this, the budget workshop that got rescheduled with the administrators, it's after budget. So my thought process on this, and I've always kind of thought this, but I didn't want to take from the community. Um, instead of having that be a community workshop, have it be where we have the administrators have be there for a board meeting and give us the opportunity to see what's in the budget and they can speak to the need, you know, during a meeting. Um, just an idea, you know, obviously the will of the board as a whole, but that was just my thought. Yeah, it, that can definitely be the model. I think that it evolved to where it was 
because I think at some point in time, people in the public that I'd love to be able to do that. So you, the, the rotation activity gives board members the opportunity to kind of sit down, but it also gives uh, council members the opportunity. It also gives, um, you know, I don't know, this, you know, the, the public, the street, you know, the, wants to know about it um you know it allows for more people to uh, avail themselves of that knowledge and that opportunity and what i have found personally is you know when people are um you know against the budget it's usually because they haven't had an opportunity to really have a conversation with that administrator or that person so that activity serves board members to be able to rotate around and ask but it also serves that opportunity for this, the public to rotate around and ask. Um, and a lot of times they leave that night with fewer misconceptions and a better understanding. And they're more, much more apt to support the budget. And there's no real surrogate for that because if we have public session, we only can give them two minutes. Mm -hmm. It's point of information, we can only respond in such and such a way. It also saves us because they, you know, instead of blasting like, you know, 50,000 come to that and then they get the answers that they're looking for and they don't overwhelm us with emails either because my priority during the budget has to be the board. So I can't, you know, the, anybody coming from public with a hundred, you know, your budget questions has to be second to what the board's asking me because the board must create a budget or, you know, must adopt the budget before, you know, the deadline. So it just gives them a chance to even walk around and have that free time. Plus those nights I'll hang around as late as they want. People will, you know, I have, First of all, I don't expect the admins to do that either, but they'll have their block of time. But you know, they have interaction. It encourages that interaction. And it's really in that interaction that people get to get the answer they're looking for because they can ask the follow-up question and then they can ask a further follow-up question. So that's why it evolved as a as a mechanism for the board to be transparent with the public. And it gave the board the mechanism for having those conversations, but it also valued and said, you can all, you know, you can also be a part of this. Um, and it ended up helping us with the overall vote, you know, people supporting it. Um, just to kind of, with what Nina was saying, I, I kind of agree that I would love to see a meeting with the board with the administrators, because to kind of what you were saying, Walt, is as a board member, I've often felt like at that meeting, take a step back like we really can't ask the administrators because when you only have the five minute rotation i know for me personally two years ago i kind of took a step back and i let the public ask their questions so i want to say i think i only got one question into one administrator that whole meeting so if there is any way to have that still happen for the community but what christina was saying to have something in the boardroom that we can there's questions yeah. um, that we would have in the community workshop had there been a lot, I guess, more time to do that. So I don't know if that's possible, but, and Christina, correct me if I'm wrong, if that's what you were kind of getting at. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was getting at that. Is like, I feel like during the community workshop, I would try to take a step back. It was, it was so quick. And in all actuality, as board members, you know, we don't, we're not supposed to reach out to administrators or staff. Um, this would give an opportunity, you know, for everyone to do it legitimately too. You know what I mean? Um, and tie it to the budget. I think it would be a good activity, but it was just an idea. If, if no one buys in, that's cool too. I, I bought in. I mean, you have the advantage <laughs> of members. Any question you ask during the budget process is given priority. So that Q&A document that's created, that is essentially based on board members' questions. So you're never in a position where you can't, the budget as board members, you are given priority. Um, and on top of that, that rotation activity gives the public trust as, a, as an element of transparency. Maybe what we could do, because, uh, you know, in fact, the old model that I, when I first came in to Tallinn, the old model, you know, was you line up admin, but it was, it was very, you're asking questions a lot of times that have to be deferred ultimately to a, an answer like a Q&A sheet as it is, because the more involved the question, the more depth that admin have a scope that doesn't necessarily expand to the full depth of the questions being asked. 
So that's why it evolved into those other models. You, you ask whatever you want, the Q&A gives you the answer to the exact question you ask, and you have that advantage over the public because the public can't necessarily do that. Um, I would recommend maybe quad, you know, doing a hybrid version of it then where we have an hour that's you. And then we have that meeting where we have public um, followed, you know, so six to seven is you, seven to nine, you know, is the public. Um, that way, you know, I also have to have certain purposes and there's some factual you know, things and all that. So having them out that night and they have that activity where it's you and then it's them, maybe that's a good way of doing it. The hard part that we deal with is, um, you know, the meeting aspect, like having you all in one place and is it a meeting or isn't it a meeting? So we just have to navigate that, given, you know, you'd have, we would basically do it as a, with no public participation. And then that would allow you, we'd have set up a structure, I would do a little introduction and presentation, and you could do some you know, Q&A walking around. And then maybe at seven, the public, you know, then it's opened and it starts the second meeting. And at seven o'clock, that becomes that workshop versus the board special session. Um, that could more work. than an hour, because I'll be honest with you, I feel the same way that when we've gone to these, I definitely have let the public ask more questions we're able to and then also you don't get to go to every single spot you're like limited to maybe doing like you know two mm -hmm. of the three yeah three, yeah. three, yeah. three, three, three. three. Well, it's, it's, you know it, but it, it's no fault of your own yeah. i mean that's you know but you kind of have like a priority and then you're like okay well i still have xyz and it would be nice to have a conversation mm -hmm. so perhaps maybe a little bit more than an hour but i like the idea of combining both because it is you know have the public ask their questions but it is really important for us. I mean, I just know that timer goes off and you're like, oh, I still have this on my list. And you know, you didn't even get to get that far. And remember, you can always throw your questions in and get them answered. Yeah, but it's nice to hear from people that are in the school. Yeah. Not, no, 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 like no. totally. Well, remember, who I tap is everybody. But you know, to get your answers. But um, the old, old, old model was lining admin up. And then having board on this side, admin on that side in a public session, and then and honestly, that could be something we do if that's what you consider more efficient. But what it evolved to was more of the like, let's sit down for ten, you know, rotate through some groups. I think that that you know, people can have more one-to-one -one conversations. You know, whether you have a table and you have like two people, and especially yeah. with COVID, social distance. Uh, you know, that's a whole other ball of wax that we're going to have to cover. But I think having those conversations would mean more by having whether that's so you could do you could do the well, we could flip it you know and just have the, the majority of the time you know or an hour and a half an hour and a half your meeting would start at six and end at nine you know you'd have the half hour special session for the board like i would like to see you keep some element of both because i do feel like it has a benefit for you i really do i wouldn't suggest it if i didn't i actually it's easier for me it's to go back to a line them all up and line you up and then we just do this answer thing but that's much harder to logistically set up is this structure i'm talking about but i think it helps you in budget season with people feeling like they had a transparent opportunity to ask so we wouldn't want to see that go away but i think one way to cover it is you know we started as a special session we do a kind of thing like that with the board and then it opens up into a public session you know more broadly with public you know participation kind of thing as a at 7 30. So maybe it starts 6 for you and then it's 7 30 for public and then it ends 8 30 or 9. And then you have kind of that opportunity. And you could jettison the whole public one if you wanted to, but I, in my opinion, you do gain something from that. Yeah, no, and I, and I have to be honest, on that one. being a member of the public, it was nice to attend that without having to. But I do think it is extremely important for board members to get their questions and have that. that so I definitely would love to see, like you said, maybe a hybrid model. Also maybe now. the 19th we could do that. Okay. You know, I'll look at the... Is there, I don't even know the location and things of that nature too, how you want to, with the social distance. Uh, that's, yeah, well, that's so that's going to be a little weird. We'll figure it out. We're, what we'll probably have to do, depending on what the what it looks like at that time, and what Omicron is doing and all that, is that you may end up in 
but that's all. So you know, there'll be these room. rooms, and from this time to this time, you know, kind of like parent teacher conferences. You, uh, you rotate around to the rooms, and the high school room will be. Well, think room. about that one and figure out how you're gonna. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> I, I have a model that I think we could use, but you'll it'll be space. It'll be I don't space. think we should do it though on the same night at FFC. <laughs> I, I don't think we want to put a five thirty FMC with a six o'clock. Well, we might. Yeah, we might want to. Read that. We might want to just figure that. But uh, anyway, we do have one in the calendar for the nineteenth. I could put it there if we want to correct the time. However, you want to do that. Lord has our hand back. Oh, well, Jaden doesn't have time yet. So, Jaden. I also just want to make sure that we're taking into account that our administrators do have. A plethora of meetings day by day, night by night. Dr. Willett, same deal. Um, and so I, I, at first I thought this conversation was going into let's have a whole nother day where we that's what I meant. Um, but then it was just the hour and a half before and after that it, it makes more sense. But um, if it goes past that hour and a half point, I'd say let's hold it off until another month or two after that. Just that way, I mean, we're not taking up. You don't have a month or two for a budget. I need to bring it to you, which ultimately comes down to we only have that hour and a half. And we, well, you would, we, we you'd have, have that hour and a half, but then you would still mix in with the public through, right. you know, but right. so you still have the, the whole time. It's just that 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 you that one to one. Whereas if you're sitting there with public, then you let public kind of ask the questions because then you kind of sit back. But that first hour and a half would just be purely board members with admin. So then the Q&A, does that go to administrators as well? Or does that, is that? No, so my job is to get other information for you for budget. Your questions are usually more involved than one administrator. And usually what you'll come to find is administrators have program budgets that they're responsible for. But in comparison to the district, the program budgets are fairly minute. So the conversations you're having with them are just giving you a broader understanding of, well, why do we need a late bus? You know, like, and they'll be able to tell you if these kids would be really in trouble without it. And they can give you a personal articulation on that. And that's where that comes in to benefit. But for instance, you know, when your energy is $1.4 million and, you know, and you're, these are the big, big things that you'd be talking about on positions of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Their program budgets are principal's office supplies, you know. So you're asking them more about um, what's talc? You know, I, I understand talc. I see some money here for talc. What's talc exactly, and why do you? Why is that separate from this? Because I never understood that. And they can explain it. To you. And then, you know, what happens is the public a lot of times will think, well, why the hell do you need that if you have this? And the principal here will say, well, these these exist separately for this reason. And that those five minutes mean they vote for the budget. And that's opportunity to ask questions about things that help you understand how the budget connects with other things. Um, but, um, but you know, in the end, at the end of the day, when you're doing your Q&As, you're usually asking about things that go well beyond the principal's program budget. And that's why it's, it's almost always directed in my direction. It always almost has to have me tapping into a, a series of people to pull the answer. And that's usually how that works. And there's the one you hit budget season, there's um, we may want to move that FFC to the 12th if we don't want to have a long night on the 19th. Okay, we'll talk. So if you want to do that, would save us that long night. Otherwise, we would, you're right, we would do FFC right into this. But then the 12th. But then we don't have anything meeting. to like look at for FFC. Well, you, you, I mean, that night you're getting the superintendent being proposed. You can get a preview and talk to some detail about it. The 19th, you'd have more to talk about. Yeah. That but, with the 19th that you brought up, just now you have a really, really long night, that's for sure, which is okay. But I but wanted you're to point have that a out. long night on the 12th with your proposing. You have a long night, but you're gonna, you have a, you have a long night, but this one year that we're talking about, the, the workshop will run at least three hours. And you, you may or may not, you know, it's just a, if that's in addition to your board meetings. We, we had to put work. in a special FFC, if I remember correctly, for the fourth week of January. I mm -hmm. think we threw it. End end up throwing, to and you do that. Get more you, detail. So you'll probably end up yeah. throwing in more. And you might even, there are some board meetings that you sometimes choose to have or not have during the budget season. There's some Wednesdays or times set aside. If you choose to do them, you do them. And if you don't, you don't. But um, you'll find that wherever you're at at that point in time, you may decide you want them or not. You may also have great conviction over what you want as of the end of the 19th. You may not feel like you need any more articulations because you. 
we don't want this. You know, we don't want, you know, um, to allow the superintendent to have a Mercedes as a sidecar. <laughs> <laughs> what line item is that? <laughs> so, you know, that might be already solidified in your mind and you may not need to actually have the word. Uh, so, I mean, there'll be things that, you know, you'll just have to see where you're at at that point in time. But anyway, I was just thinking. Okay, that's yeah, we, we can talk if you're an at the best, if you want the best way to do it. Okay, last comment, I promise. I just wanted to say, I don't want this to be construed as I'm taking away a budget workshop from the public. I don't want that rumor getting out there. This was more about how we could make it more relevant to the board. Uh, and I do think for the sake of transparency, the board part should be set up as a, as a meeting. And so the public can see what we're asking. Uh, and if people don't have the feel that it's just more of, you know, keeping things transparent um, and applicable to the board as well. So thank you for entertaining the idea. I think it's great. You'll have, you'll have to do it as a special session. As a special session, but, you know, we'll have to. With, without public participation only, because that is that is the point of getting the time. But no, like, but legitimately with, with minutes, because the community workshops don't have minutes. It's a, whereas the board, doesn't right. really have the same opportunity that, unless right. I'm wrong on that, but I feel like. I'm just saying in order for you all to be in one place at one time, you definitely have to have it be a meeting. And in order for you to have sole access, you definitely have to have it without public participation. But the meeting that thought the workshop that follows, the reason why you're not gonna be able to have distinct minutes is because everybody scatters. There's no one place to get minutes from. And that does happen, what happens meeting, which we'll probably do as some formal thing too. It just says breakout sessions occurred. And then, then you came back together. So really what you're doing is a series of two meetings, one of which is special session board of ed, not close to the public. They can see it, there's minutes. But then the second part of that, whether it ends and begins or whatever, is the workshop portion where you have breakout sessions and that's when the public can, and that's where the minutes really become more limited. They become just breakout sessions because, you know, minutes from something like that but your first part will definitely have minutes and you definitely have to have it as an organized meeting that is open to the public but no public participation because it achieves the end that miss floyd's talking about you have your time to talk to yeah no, I, I like that idea because it, it, you know just going through these for the past couple of years i do think there's a lot of times that we let the public have questions and then we have to still have other questions and just as not to to just keep on bogging you down with questions like we have people and they can just answer something like you know the rick and racks i remember talking to this <laughs> about that rack, you know yes. <laughs> just just those are kind of questions that you want to ask <laughs> yes, yeah, yes. Rack. the rick and racks or whatever like, yeah okay. so i mean just having that time i believe would be beneficial to everyone i mean especially you guys i mean the budget season it comes around and <laughs> just so it's it's a a side <laughs> <laughs> well, just structure the 19th so I'll, I'll talk to Jen, we'll get the 19th structure that way. Um, and I'm thinking, well, I'm sorry to think about this. If we move FFC to 4.30 that day, we could do 4.30 to 6 FFC. On the 19th? On the 19th. Yeah, I don't mind. We do have, um, we have a staff, I, I'm attending a staff meeting till 4.45, but we could start it at 5. Okay. And then 5 to 6.30 would give you an hour and a half FFC. But whatever you want to do, the, okay. you'll, it'll be able to, because I think I'd rather have FFC after we can at least take a peek at yeah, your um, superintendent proposed budget. Sure. And Never. then we'll probably add, I can talk to Jen too, I'm thinking we'll probably add an FFC meeting maybe the first week of February. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually when we've done it in the past. Yeah. Um, and that's okay. that's pretty much common drive. You know, you you add what you need. Yeah. You don't you may not need it. You may you just add. Okay. And I was just, re I was reacting to your initial thought of a long meeting. That's why I threw that out there. I'd rather have it on the 19th. Yeah, I'm fine with that as long as we I'd bump FFC just, up a little bit. Otherwise, we lose a lot of time, I think, with FFC. Yeah, so your FFC is basically 5.30 right now. Yeah, you move, you move it, to, it five. to 5. Okay, all right, that would work. Okay, so you guys can connect. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Brought up those details. <laughs> so at this time, any other uh, budget questions? Because then we can move on to the um, committee liaison report. 
Okay, so do you want to start off with policy since you met right before? We met, we said we met today. Uh, the purpose was primarily just to go over the tool and operations, how we how we get to what shows up on the budget and you know how we brainstorm the ideas and make the, uh, the agenda. Uh, I think it went well. Um, we, uh, we'll be ready to hit the ground running for the uh, January meeting. Okay. Um, mental health. Mm -hmm. um, three of you, anybody wants to jump in? <laughs> we'll talk about it a little bit. Um, so we kind of went over what, all right, so there are two things. One is we have our initial recommendation that's going to the council. A lot of this has to do with the council, but it kind of affects us in a trickle down way. Um, the recommendation is to partner with the Hockenham Valley Community Council um, to bring in uh, prevention wellness coordinator, a couple of different titles being floated around with that position. But it would be somebody who could assist with a variety of mental health and substance use positions is the short end of that. Um, and we're on an agenda to talk uh, to the council about that in January. Um, the rest of that meeting, we talked a bit about other recommendations that we might be putting forward. Um, one of them had to do with some school programs, which we talked a little bit about here, um, including the skills for adolescents. Um, it gets a little bit complicated, though, with the task forces for our relationship with the board as they report to the council, not the board. So I'll see exactly what direction that goes into. Or we'll see what, it's, what direction exactly that goes into. Um, and what else is there? Two other things that I'm missing here. Oh, uh, we're going to try to talk to um, the rec the department director uh, to talk about. Uh, if that might be a viable option um, to take the town into. And then, are you just going to say something? Jamie? No, I was going to say that you said it. Okay. There's something and then else. Bruce is going to come to one yeah. of the meetings. That was, yeah. that was all I had. And then I can't remember the last thing. Well, what things? There was discussion about contacting Dr. Oh, Willett again for yes. um, additional information. Yes, exactly. We wanted, we would like to bring you in, Dr. Willett, at some point to discuss some uh, statistics regarding the school system. So I'll let you know about that. Pretty much it for the task force. Perfect. Um, mm -hmm. The youth center, because there was one like right. a long time ago, and we have closed because we still used it. So that'd yeah. be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, yeah. get his thoughts on it. We'll see. Yeah. You know how viable it is, but something to look into. And for the wellness coordinator, it's for the town beast is what is they're going to come in and they're going to. So it's a proposal up on the table um, to. Uh, Human services, a um, variety of different programs uh, regarding that. Treatment for mental health um, and substance use. There's, a, there's a different components. There's a proposal that um, has been written up that I can give to board members if they're interested in more detail. I, I would like to see that as yeah. another curiosity factor, but that is ultimately the mental health collective services. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, any questions? Um, move on to. Did you have curriculum? Mm -hmm. Yes, you did. Yeah. Yes. So just keep, just keep going. Yeah. <laughs> just keep going, Jacob. I'm impressed with the task force. I didn't have anything prepared for that. I just pulled it out. So, um, so we had a good curriculum meeting. We talked a lot about different changes for that we are anticipating for 2022. Um, Dr. Willett hit on a couple of those, like the uh, African American and Latino history class, a state mandated class. It's going to be about um, continuing to roll out the Bridges math program, a couple of big ones, um, and then also continue to work up on bringing the um, kind of younger grades social studies uh, curriculum, I'm going to say up to code, it's not the right term, but you know, <laughs> try to bring it up to standards for the study that we have. Yeah. Um, additionally, uh, we looked at uh, some quarterly data reports that Dr. Willow is starting to put together uh, with regards to uh, I believe that website gets live for board members to view on the dashboard and the public to view. Uh, I gotta, gotta add the links because it's almost, we're almost done. The, the yeah. stuff that's there is there for everybody to see as it is right now. Mm -hmm. So I'm awesome. posting the final version that will be very easy to access probably January. Mm -hmm. Great resource. Be, uh, probably January. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and then the last thing we had is we did have a discussion a bit about political cartoons and 
what the what they're used for with regards to uh, um, being a learning tool and a bit about the best practices with regards to that as well. So it was a good meeting. Thank you, Jacob. Mm -hmm. And there's no other uh, committee you're on, right? I don't you're think good. so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, nothing for now for Trove. Um, communications you have not met yet. Me tomorrow. Tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone? I will say though, I like being on committees with Jacob. You <laughs> <laughs> said everything. That was great. <laughs> that was great. Perfect. Okay, so at this time, um, let's move to chairperson's report. Um, seeing that this is the last meeting for the holiday break, I do wish everybody to have great holidays for you know, Christmas or Kwanzaa, whatever you celebrate. Have a great one. Spend some time with family. Especially just a fresh air because when you come back in January, we have budget season. So <laughs> enjoy the break, is what I'm saying. <laughs> um, let's go ahead and there is no board action. There's no, let's move to public participation. So at this time, I will open public participation up again. You'll have a two minute time limit. If you could please list your name and your address once you raise your hand. Call diligently looking at the screen to see if there's any hands. Hi there, uh, Kate Ballow, 80 Towns Green. Um, I just wanted to um, thank Dr. Willett um, for really highlighting the uh, need for a public to participate in uh, the budget workshop that you're talking about coming up that the board has chosen to maintain that as part of the cycle. Um, those kind of conversations are really valuable as the public can learn um, more about what the needs are and be prepared to support the budget. Thanks. Thank you. At this time, would any other members of the public like to speak and raise your hand? Going once, going twice. Who is off the uh, public? And at this time, we will enter into the executive session once we have a vote. However, um, I know Dr. Will, you have a whole spiel you love to say about being in the waiting room. So why don't you go ahead and do the spiel and then we'll do our vote and go into it. Oh, uh, uh, yes. So those of you, I'm just, it, uh, it's so they know what's happening to them. So those of you who are uh, viewing this from the Zoom link, you are now going to be put in a virtual waiting room. Do not value you, it is because we are going into executive session. So you'll you'll notice that you are slowly being added to the waiting room. Okay, so I will go ahead and um, entertain a motion to enter into executive session. Move that we enter into executive session to discuss uh board's role in addressing personnel matters, inviting Dr. Willett into the session. Will he or she accept it? Any discussion? 